This case study is about a 20 year old female who presents to the urgent care centre with two days of lower back pain. It's an aching pain that's constant to both sides of her lower back which radiates around her left groin to her, the front of her left thigh when she's in certain positions. She has no fever symptoms, she's feeling well in herself but she's tired, she's eating and drinking as normal, she's passing urine and stools as normal, she has no dysuria, noxuria, increased frequency or increased urge to pass urine. There's no urine or faeces incontinence. She is not complaining of altered sensation or weakness to her legs or numbness to the saddle region. She has no past medical history and she isn't taking any medication. She has been taking paracetamol for the pain and she's allergic to penicillin. She works full time at McDonald's, which involves standing for long periods of time, but no heavy lifting. On examination, she looks well and is systemically well with a new two score of zero. There's no abnormal findings on the abdominal examination. She has full range of movement on her back and there's no altered sensation to her legs and she has good power to her legs. There's pain to the lower back on a left straight leg raise. The urinalysis was performed and found to be straw colour, slightly cloudy with three plus of leukocytes and negative for nitrates. The pregnancy test was negative. Elements of the pain were typical of musculoskeletal back pain, however, this young woman had never had back pain before. Also, the way she described the pain to be radiating around the groin to the front of her leg was not typical of this. Anecdotally, I have heard many patients presenting with classic UTI symptoms also complaining of pain radiating into their upper thighs. Considering a UTI is one of the most common acute bacterial infections in young women, it was necessary to consider a UTI as a differential diagnosis. The patient's midstream urine sample was found to be cloudy. Little et al.'s validation study is a good quality evidence which is transferable to this case study. They acknowledge limitations such as multiple variables, but results were highly significant, so false positives were, found to, were identified as less likely. They state that cloudy urine on examination has been found to be the most reliable independent fact indicator of a UTI. Public Health England advocate using the symptoms flowchart and urine dipsticks when there are fewer discriminatory symptoms to improve the diagnostics of UTI. Patients' urinalysis were three pluses of leukocytes. When considering the results of a urinalysis, Litter Tal, 2010, found that nitrates were the most predictive of UTI, followed by blood and then leukocytes. Following the local guidelines, which are based on NICE guidelines, they find the patient's diagnosis of a UTI equally likely to other diagnoses and advise that for urine to be sent off for culture and then consider starting antibiotics. These guidelines are based on a mixture of evidence including systematic reviews, randomised control trials and expert opinion and therefore considered a robust guideline. It was decided that there were two likely diagnoses, an uncomplicated lower UTI and or musculoskeletal back pain. Chaplin 2019, Little et al 2010 and Rana and Daskupta 2013 state that in most cases UTI management will include antibiotic treatment, however they discuss the option that acute uncomplicated lower UTIs in non-pregnant women can be self-limiting and delayed antibiotic strategy can be used with a backup prescription to see if symptoms will resolve without antibiotic treatment. A joint decision was made between the patient and I the plan was made for self-care with a backup prescription in case urinary symptoms develop or symptoms did not resolve. Consulting the local formulary, a backup prescription of nitrofurantoin 100 mg twice daily for three days was issued. The patient was given specific worsening advice regarding the development of sepsis or pyelonephritis. Also, back exercises and musculoskeletal advice were given along with worsening advice specific to Caudioquina syndrome. Pharmacokinetics of nitrofurantoin absorption. It is only available as an oral medication, Joint Formulary Committee 2020. Taken orally, it is 40 to 50% absorbed, principally in the small intestine, and has an increased absorption when taken with food or agents that delay gastric emptying. It has a 38.8 to 44.3 bioavailability. The patient had no problem swallowing and was advised to take the medication with food to improve absorption. Distribution. It is quickly distributed in most bodily fluids. Bella Tau 2015 states the serum and biliary concentrations are low or undetectable with standard doses. 
and drug concentrations in the urine easily exceed the minimum inhibitory concentration for susceptible organisms. As effective levels are distributed into the urine, this will assist in effective treatment of UTI. Metabolism. It is metabolized by bacterial it is metabolized in bacterial cells by nitrofurin reductase. Venetatel 2015 found a small amount of nitrofurin toin is eliminated by liver metabolism and biliary excretion, but these are minor pathways and do not advise any dose adjustments for patients with liver failure. Elimination. Venetatel 2015 state that it is mainly eliminated in the urine and renal elimination involves glomerular filtration, tubular secretion, uh, tubular reabsorption. Hitchings et al. 2015 and the Joint Formulary Committee 2020 say antibacterial efficacy depends on renal secretion of the drug into the urinary tract and therefore advised to avoid nitrofurin toin if the patient's EGFR is less than 45. NICE, Chaplain Steve 2019 advised nitrofurin toin should be used with caution in those with renal impairment. However, Singh et al. 2015 found that mild or moderate reduction in the EGFR did not justify avoidance of the nitrofurin toin. Patients in this, the patient in this case study does not have any renal impairment and therefore adequate renal elimination should occur and no dose adjustment or avoidance of the drug was necessary. Pharmacodynamics. Once nitrofurin toin is taken up and metabolised by bacterial intercellular nitroreductase, the immediate metabolites that are produced bind to bacterial ribosomes and inhibit bacterial enzymes involved in the synthesis of DNA, RNA, cell wall protein synthesis and other metabolic enzymes causing cell death by bactericidal effect. Nitrofurin toin reaches therapeutic concentrations in urine through renal excretion and is most bactericidal in acidic environments such as urine. Nitrofurin toin is effective against most gram-positive and gram-negative organisms. According to the NICE guidelines, most common causative pathogen in uncomplicated UTIs is E. coli, which is gram-negative. NICE guidance advises that the antimicrobial resistance quarterly surveillance found that 2% resistance of E. coli to nitrofurin toin the lowest of the standard treatments. Researchers think that nitrofurin toin's continued effectiveness and minimal resistance patterns are part attributed to its minimal effect on the bowel flora. Legal implications. The law is ever present and involved in everything we do. It is vital that non-medical prescribers work within the law surrounding healthcare to ensure patient safety and to keep themselves safe from litigation. There are four arenas of accountability, the public, employer, patient and professional. The quality, safety and efficacy of the medicines market in the UK is assured by the Medic Medicines Act 1968 by governing the supply and manufacture of medicines. It was brought in by the UK government after the flamidoride tragedy in the 1950s and 60s. The Act states that any medicinal product that is being sold, supplied or exported requires a product licence and any being manufactured or imported requires a manufacturing licence. The CSD was established in 1963. They established the Yellow Card Scheme for reporting adverse drug reactions. The CSD are now known as the Commission on Human Medicines. The MHRA are responsible for the regulations of medicines, medicine, medicinal devices and equipment used in healthcare and the investigation of harmful incidents. Drug licences will state specific information including age groups, dose ranges method of, and method of administration. In this case study, the, the drug of nitrofurin toin was given within its licence. I adhered to criminal and civil law by working within local anti antibiotic guidelines, acting with the patient's best interest in mind and reaching a shared decision that the patient and I were happy was the best option. I adhere to employee and the professional law as I was working competently within my scope of practice that is outlined by my contract and the HCPC. There are times when NMPs may need to prescribe off-label or off-license medication. This often occurs when working in palliative care or with children. The Joint Formulary Committee 2020 advises where possible to prescribe licensed products but recognises that many children may require medicines that are not specifically licensed for paediatric use. 
They go on to state that the Human Medicines Regulations 2012 does not prohibit the use of unlicensed medicines. It is recognised that the informed use of unlicensed medicines or licensed medicines for off-label use is often necessary in paediatric practice. The prescribing competency framework allows prescribing off-label only if satisfied that an alternative licensed medicine would not meet the patient's clinical needs. The College of Paramedics state that employers are held vicariously liable for employees' actions. Where the employee is appropriately trained on the HCPC register, prescribed as part of their professional duties with, the con with consent of their employer. With this in mind, NMPs must consider prescribing options carefully, for example, when national and local guidelines differ or prescribing unlicensed medicines. Both Trump and Children's outline four principles of biomedical ethics. Beneficence, the moral obligation to act in the benefit of others was adhered to in this case study, it was identified that there was two possible causes of her symptoms, both were addressed and the patient was issued a backup prescription rather than advising her to return to the department, avoiding delays should the antibiotics be required and avoiding reattendance to hospital. Non-maleficence, non-harming or inflicting the least harm possible to reach a beneficial outcome was ensured by not automatically prescribing antibiotics therefore avoiding the side effects that come with antibiotics and the possible increase in antibiotic resistance. Autonomy is the right of a competent adult to make an informed decision about their own care. This was facilitated by having a shared decision-making discussion where the patient was provided with the information required to make the decision. Justice there should be an element of fairness in, in all medical decisions, fairness in the decisions that burden and benefit as well as equal distribution of scarce resources and new treatments, and for medical practitioners to uphold applicable laws and legislation when making choices. This was adhered to as local and NICE guidelines were followed, with uh, which combined the most effective treatments with cost effectiveness. If NMPs work within the competency framework for all prescribers, these ethical principles will be upheld. In this case study, I agreed with the decision the patient made about her care. However, there may be times where a practitioner does not agree with the decision the patient makes. As long as the patient has mental capacity and are fully aware of the risks and implications, they are allowed to make what practitioners may see as a bad decision. Patients with capacity must also give informed consent to treatment. Mental Capacity Act 2005. Medics have a responsibility to meet the standards set by the HCPC. The HCPC advise, advises in their standards of prescribing that NMPs must work to the RPS framework for all prescribers. Some examples of how the framework was met are four. The prescription was formulated electronically, so it was legible and contained all the necessary information. And number six. A plan was made that she was able to take the backup prescription if UTI symptoms worsened or, to, or was to return to the urgent care centre if she had signs of pyelonephritis or sepsis. She was also signposted to the NHS website for further information. The HCPC 2018 standards of continuing professional development for registrants are shown on this slide. Despite CPD being mandatory and a vital part of being an NMP, Courtney Carey and Burke 2007B found that many prescribers had poor access to CPD and had a, this had a knock-on effect on their confidence to educate and assess prescribing students. They also found in another study that CPD needs for nurse prescribers were frequently unmet. 32% of nurses were unable to access CPD. Key learning points of this case study are that in some circumstances, antibiotic therapy may not be required for uncomplicated lower UTIs. Backup prescriptions are a good alternative to allow time to see if the symptoms will resolve by themselves, but with the patient having the prescription if needed so that they do not need to re-attend unless they need to. Also, it is important that the patient is given all the information required to help take part in the shared discussion and the treatment of the treatment plan. This will ensure that they feel listened to and promote self-care and responsibility.